there. Tis I, Lord Harold Tillingsworth III. For the last 45 years, I've been the Dean of the History Department at Cambridge University. Just kidding, it's still me, Amelia. And you are watching the most intriguing military battles. For our next few videos, we're gonna try something a little different. The conflict that we're going to explore goes way beyond any one battle. It has so many nuances that we've divided it into four separate episodes. Today, we begin our series on the Arab-Israeli conflict. The first part of this special edition is dedicated to the Palestinian Civil War of 1948 and provides some background to help us dig into the roots of this conflict. To fans of pure military action, I admit that this first episode has a little bit less of it. But I promise you one thing. The settings of the conflict that we will lay out today are critical for a true appreciation of the many formidable military sequences that will be covered in parts two, three, and four of this series. In addition to the one that you are watching now, this series includes three more parts. The Israeli War of Independence, or Al Nakba, the Six Day War, and the Yom Kippur War. Before we begin, I want to apologize in advance if my interpretation of this very complicated topic offends any of my viewers. My goal is not to cast judgment or present a picture of right versus wrong. When I started my exploration of the history of this ongoing conflict, I had no intention of making it into an episode on my channel. I was simply interested in the topic. The more I learned, however, the more I understood that the interpretation of this conflict is not simply a matter of accepting the viewpoint of one side versus another. In fact, I found at least six differing points of view of these events. Those of Israelis, Americans, British, Soviets, Egyptians, and Jordanians. Of course, there are a number of other perspectives here as well. After several months of digging into this topic, I decided to put my research into production. While there is a ton of information regarding all of these topics, I found most of them somewhat biased. Clearly, I'm not even close to sorting all of them out, but I hope to provide you with a condensed version of what I found, sparing you weeks and weeks of research. Having looked at several different viewpoints, I hope that I can be as unbiased as possible. I don't have all the facts, and many aspects are still beyond my comprehension, but I'll give it a shot, and hopefully you'll find my story interesting. A small Jewish community has existed in Palestine for centuries, but only in the early 1800s do we get the first official proposal in modern history to establish a home for Jewish people in Palestine under French protection. This proposal was advanced by none other than the world's most famous Corsican, Napoleon himself, who was trying to cause some trouble with the Ottoman Empire, which back then included Palestine. Napoleon promised the Jewish people a home if they rose up against the Ottomans. While this idea didn't go anywhere, many French of Jewish origin were inspired by it. And 80 years later, a famous Frenchman, Baron Edmund de Rothschild, put some serious dough into making this dream of a Jewish home in Palestine a reality, investing in settlement, irrigation, and infrastructure. In the late 19th century, this notion even received a name, Zionism, after Zion, one of the biblical names for Jerusalem. The main goal of this movement was to establish a Jewish state in Palestine. In 1907, a British chemist and leading Zionist activist, Heim Weizmann, went to Palestine in order to assess the practical aspects of establishing such a state. Soon afterwards, the newly established Jewish Fund, supported by wealthy donors such as Rothschild, began a large-scale purchase of land, and by doing so, drove the Palestinians out. This point is still hotly debated, with some historians suggesting that the earliest Zionist movement never envisioned the full expulsion of the Palestinian population until it became clear that coexistence wasn't possible. Other sources that I came across pointed out that this was the very premise of the Zionist movement from day one, to acquire land and drive the Palestinians out. Land acquisitions and infrastructure projects allowed 
for a rapid expansion of the Jewish population in Palestine under Ottoman control. The widespread pogroms in Eastern Europe around the turn of the century further increased the number of Jewish people wishing to move to Palestine to avoid persecution. As the Jewish diaspora grew, so did the concerns of the local Arab population, who feared displacement by this rapidly growing minority. The Ottoman Empire rulers, already struggling with Arab discontent in the Hejaz, had no interest in creating yet another reason for dissatisfaction for the local Muslim population, and were hostile to any prospects of establishing a state for Jewish people in Palestine. Then, World War I changed everything. Finding themselves on the losing side of the war, the Ottoman Empire disintegrated. The lobbying activity of the World Zionist Organization had intensified in order to convince the British government to establish a home for the Jewish people in Palestine. As a side note, in the first seven days of November of 1917, two major events took place, changing the course of history in both Europe and the Middle East. On November 7th, the Bolshevik Revolution exploded in St. Petersburg, Russia. And just three days earlier, British Foreign Secretary Arthur Balfour wrote a letter to Lord Walter Rothschild in which he pledged that Her Majesty's government, headed by David Lloyd George, would establish a homeland for the Jewish people in Palestine. This document became known as the Balfour Declaration. Britain had no moral or political or legal right to promise the land that belonged to the Arabs to another people. Just one month later, in December of 1917, the British Army, under the command of General Allenby, captured Jerusalem. Alongside Allenby's army was the newly formed Jewish Legion. This legion was created under a British mandate to assist fighting the Ottoman Empire. One of its members was a young Jewish man, who later became the first Prime Minister of the State of Israel, David Ben-Gurion. Curiously, the same Jewish unit included another individual, a young man from Ukraine, Nehemiah Ruitsov, who, three years later, would marry a girl, Rosa, from Belarusia. In 1922, she gave birth to their son. She named him Itzhak. And since the young family had changed their name from Rubitsov to Rabin, the boy would later become known to the world as Itzhak Rabin, the fifth prime minister of Israel. Did you notice how I got Russia into the story? The decades between the two world wars were marked by a significant increase in Jewish immigration into Palestine, with only 4,000 arriving in 1931, while just four years later, in 1935, more than 62,000 Jewish immigrants were added to the overall population. As the Jewish diaspora grew at an ever-increasing rate, so did the social unrest of the Palestinians. While the majority were Muslims, it would be a simplification to reduce this complex situation to a two-sided clash, as over 100,000 Palestinians were Eastern Orthodox Arabs. Not prepared to deal with all this complexity, British authorities became increasingly heavy-handed in dealing with social unrest and anti-immigration protest movements. This reinforced the growing suspicion of the locals of the warm and cozy relationship between the British colonial authorities and the Jewish community in Palestine, or Yeshuv. The British mandatory shall be responsible for placing the country under political, administrative, and economic conditions that will secure the establishment of the Jewish national home. By the spring of 1936, these protests evolved into a full-blown Arab revolt. By 1939, British authorities managed to crush this revolt, decapitating Palestinian leadership both militarily as well as politically. With most of the leaders in jail or in exile, the roots of al-Nakba, or disaster, of 1948 can really be found in the late 1930s. At the same time, the Jewish community aligned itself even closer to British authorities. As British troops were already spread too thin, they increasingly delegated the authority of self-defense to the Jewish militia. 
slowly converting it into a well-trained army, the Haganah. Some of the future military leaders of Israel, such as the legendary Moshe Dayan, were inspired and trained by some mildly controversial British military leaders, such as Odd Wingate. I have not found much evidence that prior to the start of the Arab Revolt, Britain had a desire to train the Jewish army to fight Palestinians. As the revolt deepened, however, the British administration found the support of the Jewish community to be very helpful, viewing them as more predictable than Palestinian Arabs and Christians. It took less than five years to prove the Brits painfully wrong in their assessment of the predictability of their partnership with the Jewish agency. With the Arab revolt crushed, British authorities were hoping to regain control of Palestine. The start of the Second World War destroyed these hopes. Finding itself fighting Germany practically alone, Great Britain needed all the help it could get, and they began actively recruiting the Haganah members to form Jewish brigades. While finding a common cause with the British against Nazi Germany, the Jewish agency in Palestine quickly realized that this cooperation was more complicated since the British administration had changed its position with respect to the most important issue for the Jewish community in Palestine, the freedom of immigration. Britain simply could not afford yet another air revolt while fighting Germany. In order to pacify the Palestinian Arabs, Britain published a document, which became known as the White Paper. It called for strict limits on Jewish immigration and advocated for Palestinian independence under the Arab majority. As one Soviet source put it, for Jewish people, the White Paper had simply erased the British goodwill of the Balfour Declaration. While the war with Germany was fought, most Jewish politicians called for cooperation with Britain and encouraged the Yishuv to fight the war with Germany like there was no White Paper. The approaching end of hostilities in Europe. We may allow ourselves a brief period of rejoicing. Had turned the Jewish community in Palestine sharply against Britain, who, in light of the white paper, was seen as the biggest obstacle to the formation of the independent Jewish state. In 1944, an extreme wing of Yeshuv declared war on Britain, which may seem incredible given the fact that Britain did more than any other country to make the dream of a Jewish homeland in Palestine a reality. This extreme wing was represented by Irgun and Lehi, who resorted to arms in order to drive the Brits out of Palestine. Irgun, or the National Military Organization, was formed in 1937 to protect the Jewish population from attacks during the 1936-39 to 39 Arab Uprising. After the publication of the White Paper, Ergun came to view Britain as the main enemy, but reluctantly adopted the mainstream idea of cooperating with European nations in their struggle against fascism. A splinter group, which became known as Lehi, or Freedom Fighters of Israel, refused to cooperate and even attempted to align themselves with the Germans against the British. As the war with Germany was drawing to a close, Irgun had transformed itself into a full-fledged resistance group under the leadership of Menachem Begin, who later became an Israeli prime minister. Both of these groups joined their efforts with the official paramilitary organization of the Jewish agency, the Haganah, conducting an all-out war against the British. By this point, the British mandate in Palestine was in serious trouble. From the Arab population's perspective, the British were allowing the Yishuv to grow, making it increasingly likely that before long, Arabs would lose their majority. Every Jew that arrives in Palestine is one more brick in the structure of the proposed Zionist state, one more unit towards the Zionist majority against the Arabs, so that it is impossible for the Arabs to regard the matter only in its humanitarian aspect. From the Jewish settlers' perspective, British authorities prevented the much-needed growth of the Jewish community. And, guided by the white paper, 
encouraged Palestinian independence under the Arab majority, something that the Yishuv simply could not accept. The world's opinion was hardly sympathetic to Britain, as it restricted Jewish immigration to Palestine, just as the world had learned about the German concentration camps and the Holocaust. It is my attitude that the American government couldn't stand idly by while the victims of Hitler's madness were not allowed to build new lives. This situation culminated in the infamous Exodus Affair, which took place in 1947. Exodus was a ship carrying almost 5,000 Holocaust survivors trying to immigrate to Palestine. Since the immigration limits had long been exceeded, British authorities denied entry to its passengers at the port of Haifa and shipped them back to France, where they found not-so-comfortable homes in internment camps. A big flaw of the Balfour Declaration became painfully clear to all. Britain simply could not provide a national home to the Jewish people without prejudice to rights of existing non-Jewish communities of Palestine. It proved to be impossible for British administrators to balance the interest of both sides. If they tilted towards the Jewish side, then the Arab Palestinians revolted. When Britain did the opposite, the extreme elements in Jewish resistance made their lives miserable. After Irgun members planted a massive explosive device under the British military headquarters in the King David Hotel, British authorities lost their will to fight. On February 25th, 1947, Britain referred the insolvable problem to the newly formed United Nations. We reached the conclusion that they are not able to bring about a settlement in Palestine based upon the consent of both Arabs and Jews. It is for this reason that they have brought the problem before the United Nations, hoping that the General Assembly would be more successful in the search for an agreed settlement. The UN, in turn, formed an 11-nation committee, which became known as UNSCA. After their investigation was completed, all delegates were unanimous in calling for the end of the British mandate and recommended the partition of Palestine into separate Jewish and Arab states. Curiously, one of the first countries to support this partition was the Soviet Union. Элементарных прав еврейского народа объясняет стремление евреев к созданию своего государства. On September 26 of 1947, the British government announced that it would withdraw from Palestine, leaving the mess it created to the UN. The date of withdrawal was set for May 14, 1948. British public opinion will permit no more expenditure of life and treasure. It will acquiesce no longer in the use of British forces and the squandering of British lives to impose a policy in Palestine which one or other of the parties is determined to resist. Few people doubted that the partition resolution, which divided Palestine into six segments, three Jewish and three Arab, would go unchallenged. Both sides felt that they would have to fight for all of the areas allocated to them by the UN. On November 29th of 1947, the UN passed the Partition Resolution 181. Even before the British officially exited Palestine, the civil war between the Palestinian Arabs against the Palestinian Jews had already begun. From the start, the Haganah was better trained, led, and armed, with many Jewish soldiers fighting alongside the British during the Second World War. The Jewish community also stockpiled weapons and ammunition, while their Arab counterparts made no such preparations. In addition, the Arab resistance was somewhat divided, with the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, Haj Amin al-Husseini, and his cousin, Abdul Qadar al-Husseini, nominally leading the Palestinian resistance. While the Arab Liberation Army, basically Arab volunteers from all over the place, was led by Iraqi general 
Ismail Safavit, and by a moderately pro-Nazi Arab nationalist figure, a fellow by the name of Fazi al kuwukchi As a side note, al kuwukchi was not the only Arab activist who was on friendly terms with Nazi Germany. Even the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, Haj Amin al husseini visited Germany and had a nice conversation with Adolf Hitler himself. But let's get back to Palestine. The critical part in this civil war was the battle for the strategically positioned town of Al Qasr on the road between Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. During this battle, the Palestinian fighters lost their most valuable commander, Abdul Qadir al Husseini. Palestinians never recovered from this loss, and no other leader rose to command their national resistance until after the War of Independence. Once Al Qasr was lost, to the elite Palma unit of Haganah in April of 1948, the civil war was practically over. Haifa fell to Jewish forces in late April, setting off a huge wave of immigration of Arabs leaving their homes in areas allocated to the new Jewish state by the UN resolution. After six months of civil war, the last British soldier finally left Palestinian soil on May 14th of 1948. And Jewish leadership proclaimed the formation of an independent state of Israel. <laughs> Thus, on May 15th, the civil war between the Jews and the Arabs of Palestine was over, and the first Arab-Israeli war began. On that day, the state of Israel was immediately attacked by the combined forces of neighboring Arab states, Egypt, Transjordan, Syria, Iraq, and Lebanon. And this is the subject of the next part of our special series on the Arab-Israeli conflict. I hope that you'll join us to watch the next episode on our channel. Welcome back to Tillings with Mana. That video was informative and delightful. If it suits your fancy, like the video, subscribe to the most intriguing military battles, and Drop a comment in the box below. Ta-ta for now.